Anarchism is just a matter of having the courage to take the simple principles of common decency that we all live by and to follow them through to their logical conclusions. Odd though this may seem, in most important ways, you are probably already an anarchist. You just don't realize it. David Graeber Hi, welcome to Everyday Anarchism. I am your host, Graham Culbertson. The aim of this podcast is to take that quote by Graeber seriously. I am an anarchist. You are an anarchist. Everyone is an anarchist, even though they may not realize it. How am I making this outrageous claim? Well, let me start with an anecdote. Like many people who are interested in podcasting, I'm a big fan of Mike Duncan of the History of Rome and Revolutions podcast. I highly recommend his work. His most recent work is actually not a podcast, but a book about the Marquis de Lafayette. And he was in Paris researching Lafayette. And he tells a story He tells the story of going out for a big national protest. And while he is there in this peaceful protest against a government that has made huge mistakes, he realizes he is in a sticky situation. He has gotten between two groups of people dressed in black who are out for a fight. The riot police and the black bloc. And he describes the black bloc as anarchists. And this, I think, is the standard view of anarchists. They wear black, they break windows, they fight the police. My argument, following Graeber, is that the person who is doing anarchism best in that moment is Mike Duncan, the regular person who goes out and protests. That is anarchism. The black bloc might be a version of anarchism, but it is an extreme version that is disconnected from our daily lives. And the idea of anarchism is that our daily life is really all we need. And we can make everything run the way that sort of thing works, the way a peaceful protest works works. And if that's the case, well, then you are an anarchist. Now you may be thinking, if I'm an anarchist, well, why haven't I heard about this? Well, for one thing, there really is to a certain extent a conspiracy against the anarchists. You probably uh, are familiar with and really love some anarchists. You just don't know they are anarchists. For example, Oscar Wilde is an anarchist. You may remember and enjoy Ralph Waldo Emerson, perhaps from high school. In many ways, his ideas, as well as those of Henry David Thoreau, are responsible for most anarchist thinking of the past 200 years. Gandhi was an overt anarchist. George Orwell, an anarchist. Tolstoy was at least anarchistic. The anarchists are out there. We just don't remember them as anarchists. But that's not what I want to talk about. I want to talk about on this podcast, hence the name, Everyday Anarchism, is the way that your day-to-day life is influenced by, driven by, anarchism. That's the focus. And I will walk you through my argument in this introductory episode. Let's begin with an extensive quote from Peter Kropotkin, probably still the most famous advocate for anarchism, and this is from his book, The Conquest of Bread. Anarchy leads to communism, and communism to anarchy, both alike being expressions of the predominant tendency in modern societies, the pursuit of equality. Okay, I'm already ready to stop. For one thing, he says anarchism and communism are the same thing, and he also just says they are about equality. 
So in this definition, if you believe in equality, you are an anarchist. But what does that mean? Let's go on. The history of mankind thus understood does not offer then an argument against communism. It appears on the contrary as a succession of endeavors to realize some sort of communist organization, endeavors which were crowned here and there with a partial success of a certain duration. Meanwhile, new organizations, based on the same principle, to every man according to his needs, spring up under a thousand different forms, for without a certain leaven of communism, the present societies could not exist, in spite of the narrowly egoistic turn given to men's minds by the commercial system, the tendency towards communism is constantly appearing, and it influences our activities in a variety of ways. The Bridges, for the use of which a toll was levied in the old days, have become public property and are free to all. So are the high roads, except where a toll is still exacted from the traveler for every mile of his journey. Museums, free libraries, free schools, free meals for children, parks and gardens open to all, streets paved and lighted, free to all, water supplied to every house without measure or stint. All such arrangements are founded on the principle, take what you need. The librarian does not ask what services you have rendered to society before giving you the book, or the 50 books which you require. He even comes to your assistance if you do not know how to manage the catalog. What does this mean? It means that everything is the result of cooperation. Free cooperation. The communism of everyday life, which Kropotkin is calling anarchism. Roads, that's anarchism. Museums, that's anarchism. Free lunch for children, all of these are anarchism. These are things that you think of as everyday life. And yet, as of a hundred years ago, it was obvious that they were new, that they were different, or at least in opposition to traditional legalistic and commercial ways of thinking, that these are anarcho communism. The library is anarchism. I want to spend a moment with the library and how anarchistic it is. There's these two elements here, right? It's anarchistic in that it is shared. It's communistic. In this definition, communism and anarchism are a version of the same thing, and we're not talking about Marxist Leninism. But it's libertarian in that you are free. So let's compare a library to a bookstore. There's a great superficial similarity. You walk into the bookstore and you want to find a book. And yes, the person behind the counter, just like the librarian, will help you find the book. You are free to choose whatever book you want. They give it to you. You walk out of the store. Oh, wait. You have to pay for it. And if you don't pay for it, they call the cops and put you in prison. So in the bookstore, you are free to choose your own book, but the books are not free. They are not part of a collective endeavor where society has set aside some of its resources for everyone. Only the people who can pay can get the book of their choosing. What's the alternative? Well, that would be something that is communist or collective, but coerced and authoritarian. That's school. I'm an English teacher, or I was until I left my job recently. In school, it's free. It's communistic. Everyone gets to come and read a book. But you do not get to choose which book you read. The teacher chooses the book or higher up the board. Maybe even the state government chooses the book. In the bookstore, you choose your own book, but you have to pay. In the school, the book is free, but you don't get to pick it. A personal anecdote. When I was a kid, I believe this was in fourth grade, 
we were reading a book together as a class. I don't remember what book it was. We were going along the line and reading out loud. And I loved the book. And when we had free reading time, I read ahead. I got in trouble. I was reprimanded. The teacher took the book away from me. How dare you read the book you want to read? This is school. You read the same book as everyone else at the same time. You do what you're told. You don't get to read that book. I went home. I told my mom. And she did the correct anarchist thing. She took me to the library. This is everyday anarchism. The resources are free to all and the people are free to use them as they see fit. The bookstore is free, but it costs you money. The school is free, but it costs you your freedom. The library is both things. And yes, libraries are probably funded by taxes, but surely, surely we would be funding libraries if we were allowed to fund our own libraries instead of forced to fund them by the government. Go outside, walk around. If you're in the right neighborhood, you will see little free libraries. This is a thing that people do on their own. So you are an anarchist in the sense that a library is anarchist. If you like libraries, you like anarchism. What's not to like? Okay. Now, another part of Kropotkin's quote, and this follows up Graeber also, is that everything we do works because of anarchism. You couldn't have school if you didn't have people who volunteered teachers, parents, librarians, either formally volunteering their time or just putting the extra time in to make the school work. The school says it's authoritarian and everyone is paid, but let's be honest, it's anarchism that makes school work. And Kropotkin and Graeber argues this applies to everything. Any system that works, no matter how authoritarian it claims to be, works because of anarchism. Everything, when you look underneath it, when you see how it actually works, is a form of cooperation or mutual aid. And maybe this is silly. I've decided to break down how all systems and institutions and human relationships work into four C's and show how they all are in fact one and the same. They are all forms of cooperation. That's the first C, cooperation, which is another way of saying mutual aid, is another way of saying anarchism. The other three are competition, commercialism, and coercion. Sorry if this is so cheesy. I just thought this might be a good way to remember. It helps me structure it. Okay, so cooperation we've already covered. The library, the roads, Free lunch, that's cooperation, that's mutual aid, that's anarchism. What about competition? Competition is traditionally opposed to cooperation. That's when there is one winner. That's when there is no sharing. If you think of sports, this is a great place to think about competition. Two teams enter, one of them loses. Unless we're talking about soccer, in which case you can have a draw. But nevertheless, they competed and fought for that draw. But how did we get these two teams? Obviously, a team itself is cooperation. You can't have a soccer game without cooperation. And that ref in the middle of the field right? He is expecting cooperation from both teams. When he gives an order, he is not attacked, except in extreme and tragic cases. And who put together this field? That was cooperation that made the field. And who put together this league that led to these two teams playing each other? Is that not cooperation? 
if you want to have competition, you need cooperation. If you want to win, you need teammates. If you want to play a game, you need someone to play with, but you also need someone to play against. Supposedly, we could just have the war of all against all. But how could you actually have that? If you think about um, one of our famous pop culture versions of the war of all against all, the zombie movie, the way you survive is to find friends. And are you competing against the zombies? You're not competing against the zombies. The zombies are just a metaphor for nature or society. It's just what's out to get you. Who's going to win, though? The people who work together. You want competition. You need cooperation. You need rules. You need friends. You need partners. You need teammates. You need a field. Otherwise, you're just going to get eaten by a zombie. And that wasn't very competitive of you, was it? All right. Competition is cooperation. But what about the NFL? Isn't that just about money? Isn't that just about commercialism? Well, first of all, the NFL, in fact, is a version of communism. The teams all put the money in a big pile and distribute it with one another and set all sorts of regulations. So that's communism. That's cooperation right there. But leaving that aside, money itself is cooperation. This is something that David Graeber has explained incredibly well. What is money? It is the belief in cooperation. Money exists because you believe in it. Imagine you are going into a store to buy something. Well, what are you buying it with? You're buying it with money. Which means what? Which is your promise to pay? Well, okay, I mean, this is not a promise to pay, right? You just are paying. You're handing these dollars over. What is that? That's just an empty piece of paper. Except you're probably not handing dollars over, right? You are probably paying with a credit card. So who's cooperating here? You are cooperating with the store and the storekeeper, and your bank is cooperating with their bank. Not to mention the U.S. government, who is guaranteeing the currency. Not to mention whoever created the thing that they got paid for. And whoever shipped that thing to the store that you buy. It's all cooperation. And you might say, well, it all depends on money. Well, try not believing in money. And if enough people don't believe in money, it disappears Money is just a way that we say we are cooperating with one another. That's all money is. If you want a great example of this, you can think of the movie It's a Wonderful Life. If you haven't seen it, I highly recommend it. During It's a Wonderful Life, it follows, you know, the first half of the 20th century. In America, all these historical events happen as they affect this one man in a small town. And one of the things that happens is the crash Everyone stops believing in the money. And George Bailey, the main character, he runs a building and loan. And when the bank run comes, everyone comes and they want their money. They say, give me that money. I've got my money in this building and loan. I want to take it out because I'm nervous. And George says, what do you mean? I don't, I don't have your money. Your money is in your house and your friend's house. That's where the money is, which doesn't make any sense. <laughs> the money's not there. It's not like there's always money in the banana stand. There's not physically money in there. There is the belief in the value of those houses. And everyone has collaborated collectively to make these things worthwhile. And then George says to them, I've got some money here. It's actually his honeymoon fund. He doesn't get to go on his honeymoon. This movie is a very, very optimistic tragedy. How about I just give you what 
you need to tide you over. And there's one guy in the bank who just says, no, you owe me this money. I want that money. Now, what would happen if everyone felt that way? If everyone refused to cooperate and be collaborative? Well, the buildings and loan would crash. And that's what happened in 1929. The banks crashed because people refused to collaborate. But everyone besides that one jerk decides to say, okay, George, I'll take what I need to buy groceries for this next week. We'll wait for this to blow over. And the buildings and loan is saved. Why? Because people believe in one another because they cooperate. Money is valuable because they believe in money. What if they stopped believing in the money? Well, if they stop believing in the money, the money would stop being valuable. Economists call money as we use it now, as opposed to the gold standard, fiat currency, meaning the government just declares that it is money. But there are lots of times that the government has declared something as money, and if people don't trust the government, you can't buy anything with that money. Money is cooperation. Okay. What's left? Coercion. Stay in line or we will hurt you. Violence will be done to you if you do something bad. Or you could just say, this is against the law. But what happens if you break the law? Someone comes and takes you away and puts you in prison. If you resist, they do violence against you. The law is just a way of the state declaring this is what brings us to your house to do violence to you. That's all the law is. It's a version of violence. But it too depends on collaboration. If everyone decides to break the law, there's nothing the government can do about it. This is easiest to see in speed limits. People do not follow the speed limit. And the traffic cops generally let them go unless you are hugely exceeding the speed limit or driving dangerously in some other way, which maybe you think is good, but also is just necessary. The cops cannot pull everyone over if everyone is speeding. So that's it for the law, but let's talk about violence. Let's talk about coercion. Remember, for the law to stand up, there has to be the threat of violence behind it. The people doing the violence have to be cooperating with one another, with the law, and with the government. Let me give you an example from the military. Throughout much of the 20th century, the U.S. Army had a problem, which is the soldiers were not shooting the enemy. They were shooting in the general direction of the enemy, but they were not shooting the enemy for the simple reason that they didn't want to kill anyone. This is how cooperative people are. You can be in the enemy and given a gun and trained to kill, and you still don't want to kill. Eventually, the U.S. military found a solution. It wasn't working to say, that guy's the enemy. Kill him for mom and pop and apple pie. People didn't care enough. They didn't want, they wanted to live, but they didn't care enough to take someone else's life. Not for their own life, not for America, this abstract idea. So finally, the military said, think about it. The person next to you in the trench might die if you don't kill that enemy. You are a band of brothers. You are cooperating with one another. You have to kill that enemy. Otherwise, that enemy might kill your friend. How did the U.S. government get its service members to do violence 
to the armed representatives of different states through cooperation. We can take this up a level, drawing from Roman history, which, of course, I completely learned everything I know about Roman history from Mike Duncan. The Roman Empire emerged from this period of civil wars, just decades of civil wars, where basically everyone who had an army fought everyone else who had an army, and everyone wanted to be in charge. Finally, the guy who emerged was this guy called Octavian, also called Octavius, also called Caesar Augustus. This is Julius Caesar's adopted son and the first real emperor. Julius Caesar was emperor for, you know, one brief second, and then he got assassinated because people did not believe in him. Now, people did believe in Augustus, but nevertheless, he was worried about the Civil War coming back, so he created the Praetorian Guard, the only army near the capital, and they were loyal to him. So if someone else wanted to be emperor, they couldn't because the guys who do violence are on Augustus's side. So far, so good. But I, I hope you've uh, figured out the problem. When Augustus dies, his heir, Tiberius, needs the Praetorian Guard to stay in power, which means that the guy who runs the Praetorian Guard, Sejanus, becomes the de facto emperor. Because if the people who are coercing the people so that the boss stays in charge, so that the emperor stays emperor, stop working for the emperor. If they feel like they would rather collaborate with Sejanus than Tiberius, then that's it for Tiberius. Who is going to coerce the coercers? You can say you need violence, ultimately, the threat of the law to keep people in line. Well, are you going to keep the people who do the violence in line with the threat of violence? If you are, you might cause a civil war. And Tiberius eventually removes Sejanus from power. And I don't know the details of this, but it does seem that he used a different military unit to keep the Praetorian Guard in check. You cannot coerce the coercers. They will only go out and do violence in the name of you or the state or the common good if they believe they are cooperating with you. So there it is. That's the four C's. Competition requires teamwork and shared goals and literally a playing field in a sports metaphor. It requires cooperation. Commercialism requires money, which is the ultimate form of cooperation, and money systems break down when people decide they don't want to cooperate anymore. Coercion, violence, you, you need an army or a police force to do that, and the only way to do that is to have a band of brothers, a group of people who cooperate, a group of people who believe in one another and believe in the authority figure and believe that they are working together. Everything is cooperation. Everything is anarchism. Okay, I, I can understand if I have not convinced you at this point. Fair enough. Let's move on. Let me give you something else to think about as you ponder whether you are, in fact, an anarchist, which, I mean, you are based on this definition. You can think this definition is just too broad, but that's in part... The product of this podcast is to show you that this cooperation, this mutual aid, does underlay so many things. It is broader than you realize it is. So if that's all anarchism is, cooperation, why are we not all anarchists? Well, it's not a conspiracy against anarchism. I mean, obviously, it is a conspiracy against anarchism. There's plenty of conspiracies against anarchism. The United States deported anarchists, which, to be fair, they assassinated William McKinley. The Neo-Jacobins and the Blanquis and all sorts of French revolutionaries hated the anarchists. The Russian Tsar sent them to Siberia, including Kropotkin. Kropotkin got sent to Siberia for being an anarchist. But Lenin and Stalin and Trotsky sent them to Siberia also. So this is something that the Tsar and the Stalinists agree on, that... 
they hate anarchism and that the anarchists should be oppressed and persecuted. But that's not most of the story. I think most of the story in terms of why people hate anarchism is that we have just forgotten that the world that we live in is the product of anarchism and not the black block style of anarchists with the guns and the bombs and the masks and the breaking windows, but the coming together to make a better world. I'm borrowing this idea from a French philosopher named Michel Foucault, who says that things are not normally hidden. They are just buried. They are just covered. And what we need is archaeology. The things around us have origins that are very important that we have forgotten, and we need to excavate them. Another version of this, I'm calling it everyday anarchism, but I also want to think of it as excavating anarchism, which is to say libraries are anarchism, but we have forgotten. We forgot a world in which there wasn't public libraries, and it just feels normal. And although the things that work in our life are anarchism, we don't call them anarchism, we just call them the things that work. But I think if we pay attention to the way that anarchism is the source of so much of the things that we love in this world, we can work to make the world more anarchistic, which is something I think we desperately need right now. Obviously, you've also got the problem that the people calling themselves anarchists have a tendency to be the political extremist. So you've got someone like Tolstoy, who is definitely an anarchist, but refuses to use the term anarchism. There's an important uh, American philosopher, John Dewey, um, who I definitely think is an anarchist. And he talks all about voluntary association, but he would never call himself an anarchist. So people use this term like radical democracy, or they might say liberalism or pragmatism or mutual aid or voluntary association, which are all ways of saying what I am calling anarchism. But anarchism is that other thing, that black block thing, and we don't like that. That's bad. I want to show anarchism as something broader and something much more every day. The other thing is that we just have this assumption, and it is deep, deep down, it goes back to Plato at least, that if there isn't a boss, there isn't hierarchy, there is chaos, there is the war of all against all. If someone isn't in charge, then no one is in charge, and instead of that leading to good things, that leads to bad things. So I want to introduce these sort of three interlocking terms. The first one is capital A anarchism, political anarchism, which is the idea that any form of authority is bad and all we need is cooperation. And I think I probably agree with this. But then the next step for many of the political anarchists is to say, and therefore go out and blow up government buildings or break the windows of banks, and then the new world is coming. So the capital A anarchists or the political anarchists, they tend to believe in everyday anarchism, in mutual aid. They also frequently believe in destruction and violence. And there's this huge argument within the movement about destruction and violence and the value of it, and I just wanna I just wanna sidestep it. I don't think that's where we need to be expending our energy. The other side, these people use the word anarchy to describe anarchists. These are the people who say, unless someone is in charge, everything is violence, there's nothing but war and crime. And you can see how the people who believe in anarchy, the war of all against all, love the capital A anarchists. They use them as proof that anarchism doesn't work, that you need hierarchy, that cooperation is not enough. Hence, everyday anarchism, lowercase a anarchism, mutual aid, that's what I want to focus on. 
as opposed to capital A anarchism, destroy the state, or anarchy. You see the violence that happens when you destroy the state? It's anarchy. Both of these things are going to come up a lot in this podcast, but neither of them are what I mean when I say anarchism. In this sense, um, when you bring someone a casserole after they have had a baby, that is anarchism. When everyone in the village farmed the same land, the commons, they held it in common, that was anarchism. When you help out your coworker, even though you're not getting a bonus and your boss didn't order you to, that's anarchism. When the fullback makes an overlapping run and the winger sees it and goes and covers that space, that's anarchism. Anarchism is all around you. Kropotkin even says anarchism is the driving force of evolution. Anthills and herds are anarchism, as is mitochondria. These are all anarchism. This is all mutual aid. This is all cooperation. That's what we need to see more of. And I am convinced that once you start looking for it, you will see it everywhere. Now that I've started looking for it, I see it everywhere. And I am going to show you where I am seeing it. Welcome to everyday anarchism. Now, I was hoping to produce an episode every week, but the amount of research and writing I need to do, especially since I am also a full-time parent, was just too much. But I still want to produce an episode every week, so here's what I'm going to do. Every other week, I will produce a scripted episode like that. And then on the alternating weeks, I would like to answer your questions. So once this is live, I will be collecting questions. Please send me questions, thoughts, responses to this episode as soon as you can so I can get my second episode recorded and out there to you. You can contact me at everydayanarchismpodcast at gmail.com. Soon, hopefully very soon, I will have a website up and there'll be ways to contact me there and that email will be up there. But for now, everydayanarchismpodcast at gmail.com. Email me. Let me know what you think. The final thing is let's talk about money. Let's talk about the economics of podcasting. I quit my job after a very, very stressful pandemic year. And I am now serving primarily as a caretaker and not paying for daycare anymore covered most of what I was making with my job, but not enough. So I need to make money off of this podcast or I will have to quit doing this podcast and do something else that brings in money. But I am passionate about this and I am going to put as much of myself into this as I can. And if I can make enough from doing it, I can keep it alive and be a full-time parent and part-time podcaster. But I don't want to charge you for this. Podcasts tend to make money in two different ways. One is they charge, usually not for the main thing. People are used to things being free, so podcasts are usually free. But then you charge for extras. Well, that's not very anarchist, is it? I'm not going to charge you for extras. I will produce as much as I can, a weekly episode, maybe a newsletter, all sorts of things and I will put it out there for you for free. The other way you make money is with advertising. And I can imagine maybe if there's a company I really believe in that has anarchist principles, something like Verso Books, I could imagine collaborating with them, but that doesn't seem very likely to me, or that's certainly not going to bring in the kind of revenue I need. Besides advertising, besides being commercially soulless, is just a way of selling you. If you listen to my podcast and I put ads on it, that is still your money. It is your time. It is your data. It is your information. And I am selling it to a corporation. I will let the podcast die. 
rather than do that. So how am I going to make money? Well, I am going to ask you, if you like the show and want to try and keep it alive, to donate. This is the NPR model, except if you donate, you don't get a shirt. You simply give money if you like this podcast so the podcast can stay alive and everyone gets everything I produce. If you do not have the finances to support the podcast, that's okay. If no one supports the podcast, the podcast goes away, that's okay too. I will be fine. But I will hope that what I'm doing is something that you can value. And if you do value, that you can value it financially and it can stay alive. But that will be up to you. I'm not going to ask you to buy the podcast. I'm not going to sell you to anyone. Okay. That's that. A couple last things to say after the Q&A episode, which I will run if I get some questions in. The next episode will be on J.R.R. Tolkien. Yes, we are going to Middle Earth. Tolkien was an anarchist. In fact, a capital A political anarchist. But what is the Fellowship of the Ring? but mutual aid. The last thing I need to tell you is the theme music, which you are about to hear, was composed and performed by my friend David Hill. All right, everyone. See you next time. Yeah, maybe. Anarchism is just a matter of having the courage to take the simple principles of common decency that we all live by and to follow them through to their logical conclusions. Oh. Odd though this may seem, in most important ways, you are probably already an anarchist. Yeah, yeah, me. You, that's right. You just don't realize it. Yeah.